Hello, Namaste. I'm Ruchira Gupta, your host for the podcast A Free Voice. I'm an Emmy-winning journalist who went on to start Apnea, an NGO which works against sex trafficking. I have dedicated my life to amplifying voices of the most marginalized people in the world. I'm also the debut author of scholastic book I Kick and I Fly. In this podcast, I will talk to survivors, activists and storytellers who use their voice to make a difference in the lives of young people. How does an idea turn into action? How do you change a tragedy into recognizing your own powers? Together, we will examine and reimagine the world we want. Am I a feminist or a womanist? The student needs to know if I do men occasionally and primarily. Am I a lesbian? Tongue tied up in my cheek, I attempt to respond with some honesty. Well, this business of dykes and dykery, I tell her, is often messy. With social tensions as they are, you never quite know what you're getting. Girls who are only straight at night. Hardcore butches be sporting dresses between nine and six during the day. Sometimes he is a she, trapped by the limitations of our imagination. Primarily, I tell her, I am concerned about young women who are raped on college campuses, in cars, after poetry readings like this one, in bars, bruised lip and broken heart. You will forgive her if she does not come forward with the truth immediately. For when she does, it is she who will stand trial as damaged goods. Everyone will say she asked for it. Dressed as she was, she must have wanted it. The words will knock about in her head. Horny, bitch, slut, tease, harlot, loose woman. Some people cannot handle a woman on the loose. You know those women in silk ties and print striped shirts. Those women in blood red stiletto heels and short pink skirts. These women make New York City the most colorful place. And while we're on that pesky subject of diversity. Asia is not one big race, and there is no such country called the islands, and no, I am not from there. There are a hundred ways to slip between the cracks of our not-so-credible cultural assumptions about race and religion. Most people are surprised that my father is Chinese, like there's some kind of preconditioned look for the half-Chinese lesbian poet who used to be Catholic but now believes in dreams. Let's keep it real, says the boy in the double X hooded sweatshirt. That blue-eyed, blonde-haired Jesus in the Vatican ain't right. That motherfucker was Jewish, not white. Christ was a Middle Eastern Rastaman who ate grapes in the company of prostitutes and drank wine more than he drank water. Born of the spirit, the disciples loved him in the flesh. But the discourse is not on people who clearly identify as gay or lesbian or straight. The state needs us to be a clear left or right. Those in the middle get caught in the crossfire away. At the other side, if you are not for us, you must be against us. And when people get scared enough, they pick a team. But be it for Buddha or Krishna or for Christ, I believe God is that place between belief and what you name it. I believe holy is what you do when there is nothing between your actions and your truth. Never one thing or the other. I am everything I fear. Tears and sorrows, black windows and muffled screams. In the morning, I am all I ever wanted to be. Rain and laughter, bare footprints, invisible seams, always without breath, without definition. I claim every single dawn for yesterday. Yesterday is simply what I was. And tomorrow, even that will be gone. You just heard Stacey Ann. Read a poem from her book, Crossfire, A Litany for Survival. Stacey Ann is joining us live today in our New York studio. Welcome, Stacey Ann. Thank you so much for having me, Ruchira. Gupta, amazing Amazon warrior, feminist, historian, keeper of women's stories. Thank you. It means a lot coming from you and for you to be on this podcast, A Free Voice. You are the freest voice I know who travels between cultures, Jamaica, United States, also the culture of our bodies, gay, straight, lesbian. You cross boundaries in every possible way, including in your poems and even the title of your book, Crossfire. Why did you put a semicolon after it and say a litany for survival? Why a litany? Um, you know, I am... Um... 
I would like to believe that everything that I have experienced has made me who I am now. And I think the things that we've struggled through most violently mark us most permanently. And one of the parts of my history that I've struggled with back and forth, you know, um, even as I am in proximity to people who I love, who deeply respect religion, you know, I'm a product of Christianity. And, uh, you know, I believe that that feeling that people get in church, you can't dismiss it. That feeling of belonging, that feeling of uh, a vibration of like the highest values of themselves kind of, you know, pulsing in a place that makes them feel alive and makes them feel present and makes them feel connected to each other, to the earth, to powers beyond their own abilities. I think that when you talk about the litany, when you talk about that recitation, you talk about that ritual of saying, it's actually what the most poetic parts of being Christian, the most poetic parts of ritual, the most poetic parts of, 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 um, of, of, of organized, you know, ritualistic, uh, you know, expressions of who we are trying to connect, trying to connect to each other, trying to connect to gods. And it can't be dismissed. I mean, for many years in my twenties, I tried to dismiss it. It didn't mean anything. It wasn't important. I don't believe in God. I don't believe in Christianity. I don't believe in spirituality. And I think it's because I didn't really understand that the process of connecting with things outside of yourself, outside of the flesh, was more important than maybe my young body understood. You know, connecting to the history of your ancestors, connecting to the, the, um, the, the forecasted future for, your, for the people who will come after you. It's what, it's what we, 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 we tap into when we lean into the conversation around climate change. It's how we channel the, the, um, the ways in which our ancestors pulled through difficult things. It's those, wo those women who, 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 um, who batted heads with the patriarchy and won battles, if not the entire war just yet. It's when we, when we, when we hear those voices, when we retell those stories when we channel the voices of the women who have triumphed before us, who have survived before us. That is a kind of litany. And I believe when women write stories, when women write poetry, when women write memoirs, you know, your beautiful memoir about your time working with the women in India, you know, the, 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 the work of, of, of women who consistently keep us alive, Audrey Lord and Adrian Rich and all these women who came before us, the invoking of their words, they wrote them somewhere at a table when they didn't know if they were going to survive. And here I am, decades later, a hundred years later, pulling those words, you know, rubbing them between my fingers, folding them under my tongue, calling them into being and, 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 and insisting that they give me fortitude to, to step forward and to give my own daughter fortitude to step forward when I am no longer able to hold her back. Um, I, think, I think the church has something that we have only tapped into gently. And I think we have to ask ourselves, what is that litany, that ritual, that recitation that invoking of a power outside of ourselves. We have to ask ourselves, what is that? And how can those of us who believe in a more progressive, more radically progressive existence, how can we use that to our advantage? How can we tap into that? How can we, you know, listen to a register that our ears can't yet hear? For the listeners who just heard this beautiful explanation from Stacey Ann Chin, about why she used the word litany in the title of her book, Crossfire, A Litany for Survival. Stacey Ann Chin is a poet, actor, and performing artist. She's the author of the poetry collection that you just heard from, but she's also written a fantastic memoir called The Other Side of Paradise, which is set in Jamaica, where she grew up. She has written... Tony Award-winning plays. Uh, she's done one-woman shows. She's appeared on Oprah Winfrey. Her poetry has been featured in New York Times and the Washington Post. 
She proudly identifies as Caribbean, Black, Asian, lesbian, a woman, and a resident of New York City, as well as a Jamaican national. She recognizes no boundaries. And to her, the idea of litany means also crossing a boundary. She sees a beautiful life force, a mysterious life force in the universe. And Stacey Ann, you know that I have had so many conversations with you about my work in the red light areas of India. And I noticed that I too have an impulse to do more and more because I feel that there is this mysterious life force which compels me to do the work. Have you found that in the work that you are doing now in Jamaica? I know that during COVID you bought a farm. Yes, 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 yes. We bought a farm, Kindred on the Rock in Jamaica, on the top of a hill in St. Catherine, an hour outside of Kingston. And I didn't quite know exactly what I was doing or why I was doing it, but something was calling me. And um, I think I had just bought a house in New York and I felt deeply trapped in it, which was mind-blowing because, um, you know, and, and I, I don't know if I felt trapped inside the house or if, if I felt trapped by New York City. The pace of it that had now stilled to, you know, complete, uh, you know, lack of movement. Like everyone was in their house afraid of their neighbors. And we couldn't grow anything because, the, you know, the land in New York behind your house is not fertile and you don't have any space I mean and and uh, you know I have to say that New York is home which is why I straddle both both places because New York remains home for me the energy of this place saved my life when I was a young lesbian when I was a young writer when I was a young woman when I was a young immigrant uh the pace of the city the number of people who live here the cross-section of like wildly entertaining, you know, fierce young people who come here every year and attempt to recreate the wheel. <laughs> so um, I love New York City and I will always be here and home in New York City. And so I'm, I'm deeply grateful for, um, for having a place to return to when I come. But that, it was funny, having bought a space in New York allowed me to leave New York because I know I could come back home anytime. Uh, and, and that raises the question, of course, of, uh, of, of property and how it offers freedom to those who have it and how then it becomes a trap for those of us who don't have it. Uh, and so I just kind of picked up and left um, and a voice kept telling me to, 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 to find somewhere to, so I can grow things where you can see the sky and where there is dirt and um, where there were people with perhaps less complicated daily desires. So, um, uh, you know, I, I found myself on the side of a hill in, in Jamaica with, um, with all this land uh, to be steward of it. And I pulled in the community. And I, I you know, I had this idea that I was going to go to this place and I was going to teach these people about community. And I was going to, you know, talk to them about... Um, being LGBT and how they should be accepting and we should talk about feminism and I was going to, you know, introduce the jargon of, you know, you know, New York contemporary activist language <laughs> into mm -hmm. their yes. lexicon. And then I ended up in Point Hill, Jamaica, in St. Catherine. And I must say that they have taught me more about community than I was even aware of, which is strange because that kind of village community is where I spring from. My grandmother had me there when I was a, a young child. I lived in a village until I was like nine or so. And then I came to the city of Montego Bay and then I went to Kingston when I was 16 and then I came to New York when I was 24. So I have been moving into bigger and bigger cities. And what I hadn't noticed was that even though I was pushing for my own personal freedom, my own personal freedom as a lesbian, my own personal freedom as a woman, my own personal freedom as a Jamaican, my own personal freedom as an artist. I had been working for those things for two and a half decades. I had really forgotten 
how to truly be in community. So in my head, I was, you know, the, 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 these people have disabused me of the of the notion of 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 this transactional community that had become norm for me in New York. So I would, uh, so a lot of the workmen who work on the farm, a lot of the people who live around in the village, they would come and do something for me and I would say, or they would bring me some fruits and I would say, so how much do I owe you? And they were, they were like, everybody calls me Miss Chin <laughs> <laughs> because that's a thing in Jamaica. You know, it's a, it's a framework of, I don't know if it's, is it the same in India where they call uh, they, the Chinese person Miss Chin or, you know, like anybody yeah, who is sort say of. chinky or something, right. but we also consider it not so right to say it. So, you know, we try to avoid it sometimes. But in Jamaica, like it's, it's, um, I don't know if people see it as an insult because in Jamaica, because of the race construct, yeah. I think that it's, it's not more bad powerful. to be Chinese. If you're black and somebody says, oh, you look like a Miss Chin, it's not an insult. And in if, India, it could be like you're chinky or you have chinky eyes, could be that you're a minority, you're mm-hmm, fringe. Mm-hmm. So it's a little bit different. Yeah. Yes, it's a little bit derogatory there. Yes. So, well, in Jamaica, and my last name happens to be Miss Chin, so it just lands, everybody says Miss Chin. Um, and, and they would be like, you don't have to pay for that. I mean, that just came off my tree. It just grew on its own, so you don't have to pay me. And then one of the... T- I've I've noticed that when they work together, what they all have different skills. Like there's a mason, and then there's a plumber, and then there's a person who works with um, windows or whatever. And whenever one needs a house built, they all will just take the day off from work, and they would all just land up at that house, and they would just build the house. No, I have never seen that happen in New York. I have had friends come by and help me bit by bit. But to come and say, we're going to raise this house and we're going to like build it from scratch and we're going to like make it happen all. All you have to do is make sure the materials are here and there's no cost to us, even if it means uh, uh, costing us a day of work. Yeah, because it's yeah. not like they don't, when they take off work, they get paid for it. They, so, and this happens consistently. I, when it happened the first time, I thought, oh my God, this is so amazing. But it happens all the time. And it happens when someone has a, an animal that needs to be slaughtered where people show up and they kind of like do it together and then some people get and then maybe who has more money pays a little bit of a a portion of it and helps them to get it together and like sell it. There's a a way that sharing happens, you know, um, people give me jackfruit, you know, breadfruit, gineps, like all these fruits, they just, and it's not like they couldn't sell it. Right, yes. Yeah, and and I'm still learning how that is possible because I think I'm from New York where if you have something that is worth money and you have need for money, you have to get that money so you can take care of yourself and not give it away to and someone else, you know. It's interesting because I've been thinking right through the slowness of the lockdowns that one of the new binaries that I did not notice but was around me all the time was the consumer and the consumed. Mm. And in our uh, fear of not becoming the consumed, we sometimes rush to become the consumer because we think then we are more in control of our lives. Mm-mm. And uh, I notice this even in uh, issues of prostitution and sex trafficking that I deal with, that uh, you know the seller and the sold often become the same because the woman who's standing on the street is selling her body, but she's also the sold. And somebody is consuming her. So very often, uh, you know, she tries very hard to become like the brothel keeper or bring in some other younger girls who she can then sell to look after her retirement. And it's like a no end. There's no end to the street. Like she just has to keep walking and walking. It's a, and and that, that brings me to the question that I'm always asking myself. Um, capitalism as a model. Like. I, I, I often push myself to ask, what's the end goal of capitalism? Like, at what point, at least socialism, you know, there's an understanding that we all take a breath when everyone has what they need, and then we start again and we, you know, we, we kind of share out what needs to happen. But, and I mean, even communism, you know, flawed as it is, it, it has at its center that everyone must have what they need. Whereas capitalism depends entirely on the, you know, creating more vulnerable individuals at the bottom of the hierarchy 
of the of the financial hierarchy. Exactly. And I just wonder how can we uproot hierarchy because hierarchy itself is doesn't have to be. It's not inevitable and it's not normal. So when do we actually begin to normalize this hierarchy that it is the norm? I think gender. Because when we are born at home, we begin to think it's all right for one class of human beings to order and one to obey. One class of human beings to get paid for their work and one to take the payment. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And uh, the, you I know. struggle with that at the farm because, you know, um, a lot of the resources are either my own or procured by me. And so I become the trustee. I am the steward of the land in, in, in the moment. So, you know, um, you know, when people hand over monies, whether it's their $5 online or I get a grant for something, I am the one who is tasked with making sure that the money is spent in a way that, you know, uh, can be accountable to the giver. Very beautiful. Because also, you know, when you were describing the community in Jamaica, that how you built your house, how you began to farm, how you share the fruits, I was thinking about it that it's the same in a village in India. You know, if there's overproduction in a fruit tree, nobody goes out to sell it all the time. Sometimes they will just send it out to the people living around them, you know, taste the fruit. The fruit is very ripe today. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And And then the culture of waste is very different there. Here, I, 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 after a year and, a, and eight months being in Jamaica so much, I realize how much my own understanding of waste has shifted, you know, because when I was a kid, we didn't share anything. Um, I'll tell you a story about when I was younger. Um, I had just come to the U.S. and had been here maybe two years. And then I went back home to my friend um, Maziki. And I went to Maziki's house and Maziki made me a cup of tea and she handed me the tea and I sat and we're about to chat and catch up and get, you know, updated on all our gossip in our life. And I look in the cup of tea and there are ants floating in the tea. And uh, so I said, oh, Maz, there's ants in the tea. And Maz says, oh, there was probably ants in the sugar. And then she just kept talking. And I stood there for quite a long minute trying to figure out like what 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 happened here like <laughs> because my american self had become quite accustomed to let's just toss it and make another cup and you know after maybe about 2 minutes of her what her she kind of noticed that i was kind of not frozen and not drinking and she said uh do you want me to strain it yeah, and then my she strained. Mother, exactly. In India, same thing. If there's an ant in the tree, somebody will just take a spoon and throw the ant out, but not throw away the tea. The, right, right. And, and and even like in the restaurants, when I go there and I say, um, "Oh, this food is not exactly the way I asked it for it to be prepared," and the question that will be thrown back at me is, "Do you want some salt?" Yeah. Is there something we could add to this to make it less difficult for you to eat it? But you will eat it because you are paying for it. And just the notion of like waste and here how much we get in a serving and how much we throw away. And there are people in the village in Jamaica without enough to eat. And I'm watching us throw away so much food. But this has to do with this capitalist notion that if you give the leftovers, if you share them, then you won't have as many consumers. Because if you have fewer consumers. Absolutely. Because if everything is monetized, then... If you don't, cannot monetize, then it should be thrown away. Yes. And this I realized uh, in a way, I went even beyond capitalism this time during the lockdown when I was in my uh, family home in a small agricultural town in the Himalayas and there was a three orchard, three acre orchard around us. And, you know, we were just living day to day in the middle of the trees and the grass. And sometimes there was electricity, sometimes there was no electricity, sometimes the Wi-Fi work did not work. Uh, And we were eating what was growing. The one thing I realized was that, you know, life did go on as usual. And there is no hierarchy in nature. And there is nothing like socialism or capitalism. But there is something beyond that, which is small is beautiful. And the smaller that we can organize our lives around that, instead of getting like tomatoes from Portugal or potatoes from Spain or uh, watermelon from Thailand or, um, you know, things from far away, 
eating what grows around us, um, consuming what grows around us, consuming to the point that what we throw away can also be regenerated from the earth so that even that waste is actually part of a cycle of life and rebirth. Those were very profound things which I noticed. And one of the most special moments of the five months of lockdown for me was when I saw the caretaker, our gardener, actually, um, you know, snap his fingers like this before plucking the leaves of a tulsi plant. And I said, why are you doing that? Because we used to mix the tulsi plant in some water and drink it uh, every day. And he said, I just want to let the plant know that I'm going to pluck a few leaves. And I thought, <sighs> look at this connection between a human and nature. Mm -hmm. And he never even thought about it consciously. And I saw that in everything around me, in the daily routine of how people lived. Acknowledging they, your own consumption. Exactly. So at least it becomes, you know, n n not a, a, a kind of... A, you know, um, you know, what's the word? Like you're not oblivious to your own consumption because we're about to consume the Tulsi plant. So we, you know, it's it's of little consequence whether we believe the plant is able to be warned or not. But just your own understanding of uh, it reminds you in that moment, that finger reminds you, it reminds the listener. It, in, it um, invites a person who doesn't know to ask. And exactly. therefore, to, to, for the knowledge to reach farther than just my own ears. And also in the smallest, beautiful, I, I, what I learned was that you actually know the person who's producing something which you are consuming, which makes the relationship also very different. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So if you were, uh, you know, as the lockdown slowly opened, the tailor would come to the house. You were actually sitting with the tailor, you know, designing the garment on the sewing machine. And... The vegetable vendor would come exactly as mm -hmm, you spoke mm -hmm, about mm -hmm. and we would go through the vegetables and choose them or so many other little things. The milkman would come mm -hmm. and you actually, he had said that today the cow was felt like this, you know, she wasn't up to her game. And we would talk about the cow for hours. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so I find myself talking about the chickens for hours, you know, when they lay, why they lay. You know, which one is having an argument with this? Oh, these two roosters don't get along. I mean, like I find myself having conversations that uh, privilege the lives of beings that would not even be considered here in our, you know, in, in the machinations of city life. Uh, one of the things that I, as I said, I struggled with in the farm is like the person who owns the farm, the person who procures the money, the person through which the money comes in. Uh, you know, the class structures, not necessarily of the village, but certainly of the village, but definitely of the wider um, society that informs village life or has power over village life. That structure, that hierarchy is very alive and well. And I myself am not sure how to deconstruct it. You know, as I'm there, I don't always know how to deconstruct it because there are moments when I have to say, no, this isn't possible because we don't have the money or no, this has to be done or no, this person can't do that because we just don't have the resources. And I'm the one who knows that we don't, you know, I'm the, I'm the body who knows that there is no such resource available for that kind of activity. So I have to say no. And then the act of saying no reinforces the hierarchy. So I'm really open to other people who are, uh, who, are, who are having spaces where they are stewarding land and they, are, uh, they, have, they find themselves with like structures and blueprints that I might learn from. I'm really open to connecting with other farmers, other people who are trying to radically deconstruct power in the traditional forms, you know, with respect to race and class and gender. Like I'm... I'm I, I don't claim to know everything. I'm deeply out of my depth. Um, so, I, you know, I'm, I'm inviting for all the listeners who are out there to reach out and help us at Kindred on the Rock to talk through this and find new ways in which power can be shared between people who are haves and have nots and people whose names are on titles versus people whose names are not on titles, you know. That's Stacey Han Chin asking all of you listeners out there about the power of saying no and about the power of empathy and understanding how can we cross 
all these barriers between us and hierarchies and maybe share a little so that we don't have to go through the pain of watching someone else starve. How do we change? A few things here and there. And that reminds me, Stacey Ann, that I was blown away when I first read your memoir, The Other Side of Paradise. Growing up in a slum as a kid and overcoming obstacle after obstacle, bringing yourself up basically after your grandmother was not around to do so anymore from the age of nine. And yet you were gritty and humorous and you never gave up. Uh, and then finally, of course, as a young teenager, you came to New York and began to find your voice in different ways in New York. When was the moment that you did realize that you had a free voice through all these struggles? You know, I, I um, it's interesting that you ask it that way. I think I thought for much longer than I actually had that voice, I thought I already had it. In many ways, um, having read the works of, you know, Toni Morrison, that, you know, I mean, even Shakespeare's, you know, uh, Merchant of Venice, when you can understand that your body can be held, but that your voice and your mind could remain your own. And if I had the good sense to know how trapped I was, I might not have pushed so hard. But it is the stories that were written by these women who left, you know, books. I mean, I don't know if you know who Linda Lovelace is. I read I her. Do. <laughs> it's, it's crazy. I read her memoir, The Ordeal, when I was nine. How did you come across that? I don't know. I found it in a bunch of like books, you know, like I lived, you know, as I said, in this rural area where the house was on a hill and they didn't have the engineering, uh, you know, capacity to excavate and like flatten a part of the house. So what you had is like half of the house stuck in the hill and then you had like stilts. Mm. And so the underneath the house, the cellar of the house, which is really the part of the house that is not on the ground, but is on stilts. And there's a, 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 a place underneath the house where garbage and books and everything used to be thrown. And I used to spend so much time underneath the house. And then in this pile, and I read everything voraciously. I just consumed everything. And I remember reading about this woman that was like trapped and... You know, in for, pornography. Yes, in pornography and forced to do all of these things. But, you know. Um, and was also a star in a movie called Deep she, yes, Throat. Yes, she was she was the um, she was the the, 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 the the female lead in a in a film called Deep Throat. And it came out afterwards that she was actually being held prisoner and um, forced to participate in this pornography that was being filmed and had gone and like made so much money and been so. And she never got any of that money and a man controlled her day and night. Absolutely. And I read the story and I don't know if I understood everything, just like I don't know if I understood all of Merchants of Venice when I read it at eight. But I know that like there was this woman who just kept going every day and who was going through these difficult things that felt more difficult than maybe some of the things that I was going through. And she was still able to come out of it and write a book. And so even if I didn't consciously know that there uh, such a thing was possible, um, somewhere inside of me knew it because I read so many stories. I read Anne of Green Gables, which now that I've re I reread it the other day as an adult, and it's quite racist and sexist in so many ways. But I read a book, you know, I read um, Little House on the Prairie. I read all of, you know, I read, uh, you know, books written by Toni Morrison, like um, The Bluest Eye, like Tar Baby. I read all of these books that had these women who wouldn't quit. And, uh, you know, their stories brought them to a future that they did not, they couldn't yet see. And I, I don't know if I saw myself as a writer or if I saw myself as an activist or I saw myself living in New York. I didn't know if I saw any of those things specifically, but I knew. And my mother left me when I was born to go to Canada. So I came into consciousness knowing that a woman could leave, even if it had so much pain attached to it for me, like her leaving me and abandoning me in these difficult situations. 
I understood from the moment that I could understand anything, I understood that a woman could just up and leave her situation. So I think as painful as my mother's leaving was, she actually gave me the understanding, the possibility, the door of having left. Because if if my mother had access to um, to, to 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 healthcare and an abortion if when she wanted or needed it, she might not have had to flee and leave her children and become the woman who would you know, bear the scorn of everyone of being the kid, the woman who left her children, you know, uh, you know, and, and I, I know no man who carries the scorn that my mother carries for having left her two children, for having left 15 of his own children. No one looks at him with scorn, but Absolutely. my mother is the scorn of the earth, the pariah, the worst that a woman could be to leave your children. And yet you couldn't, I mean, and, and now in this moment where America has, begun to turn back with regard to women's rights, women's autonomy, women's re uh, reproductive rights, then I think people are beginning to understand what it means. I mean, there's so many hundreds of stories coming to the forefront now where women are being forced to become mothers, to take on a whole life that is antithetical to their own desire, to their own capacity, to, you know. Absolutely, because it's such a... a spiral uh, that if you become pregnant and you cannot have an abortion and you're a teenager, then all your options foreclose immediately. You have to drop out of school, you have to get a job, you have to uh, maybe marry early and slowly, slowly the world becomes smaller. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And very few women can actually choose to leave because of the conditioning around them because uh, the messaging, as you said, is such that this is your job and this is what you have to do. So women's bodies are controlled as the means of production and reproduction. We are either cheap labor or produce cheap labor. Mm -hmm. Oh, and when and and that labor, uh, it's it's the only you know what men do or what men are encouraged to do in the home, in the family, in the society. It quickly became monetized, as in what men do, they should get paid for it, but. There have yet to be a conversation about what women do or what women are encouraged to do or forced to do or expected to do and how we monetize that. Absolutely. You know, uh, you know, it's the longest job. You know, it, it's the only, you know, men don't have to, you know, use their body as a vessel for a human being to pass through it. And yet it's the only part of the familial job that no one feels needs to be monetized. And even race actually rests on the control of women's bodies because it's through our bodies that race can be reproduced. Absolutely, absolutely. I mean, I, I that's maybe the most profound thing you've said today here when you say... Absolutely. I, yeah. I haven't thought about it in that way, but absolutely that's true. That's true. Race is... <laughs> because, because uh, you know, think about the the what's going on in the United States. Why did Roe versus Wade have to happen now? Because the demographics in America have changed, right? Already that baby is already born mm -hmm. who has created more brown and black people in this country than white people. And so uh, the backlash is actually to control women's bodies. Indeed, indeed, indeed. I mean, you know... It's amazing how deeply connected all of these things are. You know, all these varying ways that we are oppressed as people, as people of color, as Indians, as Chinese, as black people, as women, as immigrants, as, you know, artists, as progressive thinking people, as, I don't know, you know, whatever, journalists, as, you know. It almost seems as if um, it, it's this giant, very tightly woven tapestry to uh, perpetuate a certain kind of... Power and hierarchy. Exactly. exactly. Absolutely. And as you said, money. You know, because it's greed. Just greed for more power, more money. Greed for more power, more money. It just goes on and on. But, you know, I do want you to share with our listeners on a free voice um, something which touched me deeply when I read The Other Side of Paradise, your own life struggles. Yes. I want you to share a little bit of that story. Well, I mean, uh, I was born in Jamaica to a black mother who was very, very, very poor. And there are um, 
there are lots of stories that evidence that my mother was um, having, you know, was a sex worker. Um, my father was, um, and is, you know, I mean, was a, a, a powerful Chinese businessman in the community with uh, many businesses that were thriving. And my mother was very beautiful and very poor. Um, it's it, it's such a common story that spans almost every country <laughs> in the world. You can always find that powerful businessman with that young girl. And sometimes she is um, very sweet and not very sassy and fierce, or she doesn't necessarily, sometimes, you know, uh, the power is not so obvious when she seems to have, you know, so much of the upper hand in the conversation when she's a young, beautiful girl and she's willing and she takes, you know, power in her own body. And then sometimes she is completely powerless and is um, made felt further vulnerable by her interaction with this man. But there's an interaction. My mother maintains that my father sexually assaulted her um, and uh, she gave birth to me. Uh, but only maybe six and a half months after, which is some people use that to say, but I was born very small and no one knew my mother was pregnant. And um, she hid the pregnancy from my grandmother. But my grandmother, you know, knowing something a little bit more than what my mother knew, probably knew she was pregnant. And on the night my mother went into labor, which is um, Christmas Eve, late at about 1130 or so, my mother went into labor and she wanted to go and use the the outside latrine, the the outhouse. And my grandmother blocked the door and insisted that if she had to go, she had to squat on the floor in the one-roomed house and do what she had to do. And she squatted and out popped a, 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 a pound and a half Stacey Ann. And my grandmother immediately cut my umbilical cord and kept me. My mother left shortly after that, days after she, my grandmother tells me. And my mother left left me with my grandmother who was poor, deaf, and wonderfully um, full of stories. Uh, and I ended up living with my grandmother in a bunch of different places until I was nine. And then my mother came back and did a whole bunch of like crazy things, which removed me from the care of my grandmother and put me in the care of another woman who was, you know, under so much duress and had so many children and didn't necessarily want to keep me. But my mother said to her, hold on to her for two weeks. And then I ended up in, in, in that house. There were many older boy cousins and uncles who would um, who would uh, molest me, sexually assault me. Um, and for many, many, many years, I perfected the art of like dodging my cousins and running out and being away from them or making sure that I was near to a, a, a an older woman who would at least whose presence would at least deter them. Um, and I did, you know, I, I had a love of reading and did well in school and maybe inspired the love and help of all my teachers, did very well in school, ended up at teacher's college, ended up at university, breathed a sigh of relief when I landed at university and had the moment to consider, okay, what are my own desires for my body? And decided then that I much preferred to be close to women. So I came out as a lesbian and was attacked by about a dozen boys on campus for saying out loud that I was a lesbian. And then I left Jamaica and came to New York, hoping that New York would be a place where I would be safe. Um, but of course, when I landed here, my blackness was an issue and that became another negotiation. And I ended up very much on this side of town where, where we are on the Lower East Side at the New York and Poets Cafe doors down, um, reading poetry and learning how to raise my voice alongside other activists, other poets, other writers, tell my own story, listen to other stories, um, validate each other with the, 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 the joy of, of, of claiming our voice in public and screaming our truths, you know, um, which was completely different, which is completely opposite from what we had been you know, experiencing in our own small places, small, like, you know, towns in Texas or Trinidad or South Africa or, you know, any of these places where we couldn't scream them. But in New York City on the Lower East Side in the poetry cafes, we could quite loudly 
uh, declare that we were lesbian or we were gay or we were, uh, you know, atheist or we were, you know, undocumented or any of the things that we felt like we were so quiet about. And that's what started the fire that now lives inside of me. Um, and as I get older, you know, not necessarily blazes, but certainly smolders quite, you know, uh, consistently. I, th I feel like, you know, um, I tell people when I was in my 20s, I walked around with a, a sledgehammer and like cracked everything that was crackable. And then in my 30s, I was like, oh, you know what, Stacey Ann, you should like try to pull back a little bit and like find a scalpel where you can like more, you know, strategically reach in and cut a tendon and like take down the whole tree. Um, yeah. and, and I think in my 40s and my 50s, I will keep both of them and maybe discover even other methods. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. You know, it's very interesting because I was just thinking that there must be young people who are listening to the podcast and they must be wondering that how did Stacey Ann have the fire in her belly? Books, reading, but, you know, to resist, to do well in school, to find the escape route through university, then realize even that's not enough to come to New York and be black, lesbian, young, poor probably. Mm -hmm. And uh, even then to find the fire in your belly to go and recite poetry in cafes and clubs. How did you have the courage? Where does that courage come from? I think um, anyone who's made a fire, actually built a fire, which I do quite often on the farm right now. <laughs> and so... Mm. You know, um, if you take one piece of wood, you can light it and you can put it right there and it'll blaze for a bit and then it would die down and then it would smolder and then it would go out. But if you lay that wood against another piece of wood and you put another one next to it and you allow a little bit of air to pass through them, all of a sudden you get this giant blaze. And I think when I was young, I didn't necessarily have another piece of physical wood that could lay itself against me and blaze with me. But I had those books. And so those books and those poems and those stories that I read in school and all these women that I knew existed, even if I didn't meet them, I knew they were out there. And so I kept their own blaze close to mine that kept mine going. And so by the time I landed in New York and landed on the Lower East Side and stepped into the New York and Poets Cafe, which was packed with bodies that were looking for change, that were seeking progress, that were insisting on, 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 on our voices being heard. By the time I got there, I had already been practiced in the, in the process of making fire with other firewood. You have, know? have you read the book, How the Steel Was Tempered? No. That's a book I'm going to gift you, actually. Oh, I can't wait. I it's, can't wait. It's brilliant. But, uh, you know, also um, this idea of the smoldering fire, it comes from books, but it possibly came from the stories your grandmother told you. It possibly came from the fact that your mother left. Like, everything seems like kind of resistance. And, um, you know, resistance never dies is the, what I'm hearing from you. Mm -hmm. And you must have felt a sense of alienation again and again from what was going on to you. Deeply, deeply. I, um, I, I felt, you know, like there was no one in the world who was experiencing this thing that I was experiencing. And even when I read other women's stories, you know, uh, you know, I would, I would, I would counter my own hope by saying, but they've already got through and you don't know how, and none of them are Jamaican <laughs> and none of them are from where you're from. Um, I think, I think when you mention my grandmother's stories, I know for sure that her stories were a large part of the very first building blocks. She used to tell me, um, which is why I'm saying that like a lot of the lessons that are handed over to us are handed over to us in the scripture, in the Bible. You know, they're woven in. I mean, they're, you know, they're distorted with, you know, patriarchy, patriarchy. And, and all of that. But, you know, um, my grandmother used to say the stone that the builder refuses will become the head for cornerstone, which is mm. from, um, from the Bible. And she used to always say to me, make sure you do well. The best revenge you can do 
make sure you do well because one day your mother is going to come back and want to be close to you. And one day your father will recognize that he, you know, um, he, 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 he messed up by not being close to you and by not staying close for the magic you will become. Did that happen? Uh, I think, yes, I think that they are, they are both, um, yes, I would say that they, they would want to be closer to me than I am inclined to be close to them. But I, I, you know, you ask me that question and I'm, I will not allow people who are not good for me to be really, really close and folded into my life. But I also understand the value of forgiveness of mercy of a deeper understanding of another person's journey and so and that's what i find very interesting about your work because i've been i've been friends with you for a few years now and i've read your books is that you have anger you have rage you use it to resist but you don't let it consume you you haven't become toxic there's no hate in you why, why, why? You know, because, um, again, I, I, I hearken back to like my early leanings of forgiveness. I mean, and forgiveness doesn't mean that you allow the person to do the thing to you again. Mm. You know, you can make your boundaries. Mm. But if you can understand that there is a larger oppression project that makes victims of us all and you push back at the people with some power but you understand that this structure is much larger than any one of us so you're not crazy the system is crazy the system is crazy i'm not crazy and in fact um the person who's hurting me is also a victim of you know, i won't allow you to hurt me and i will hurt you back in defense of myself but especially for the people who can make the journey towards growing. I find that as people age, as these grays come in, as the lines on our face soften, as the folds in our bodies change to flabs, um, I find that most people are able to consider their actions and perhaps acknowledge where their own you know, where their own decisions caused you pain. Mm. And that, that acknowledgement looks different from person to person, you know, and the language of it. Sometimes the left, those of us who live in the left, those of us who live in the educated left, we can kind of lean too heavily into what, what it means to have a person apologize to you. Like one of the boys who was very brutal to me physically when I was a teenager, I've taken my daughter to see where I'm from, Mm. And his hands were the most gentle when he was showing my daughter something. Oh. And he was um, deeply, um, you know, and, and, and the kinder I was to him is the kinder he was to my daughter. And, you know, he had this dog that he was pretty mean to and he tied the dog and the dog was supposed to be a watchdog. And my daughter cannot um, bear any animal being mistreated. So she very easily went over to the dog, made friends with the dog. and so he was there kind of like hovering over them, making sure that the dog wouldn't become violent with her. And he was helping her to show the dog how to move or to tie the dog someplace. Or if she needed like a guava or if she needed a mango, he'd climb the tree and go get it for her and like handed it to her in this like deeply like kind way. Um, yeah, I, I, you know, I, he, he perhaps didn't have the capacity to be that for me. But I understood that the journey towards redemption Beautiful. was not only for me. You know, so what you're saying is there's never anything which is static or absolute. And people can change and transformation is possible. And that makes me think about something about your farm and reconnecting with the earth. Did, did that help you get over any sense of alienation you had? Just reconnecting with the earth and understanding this journey of transformation. Or was it your daughter? What, how did this happen, this profound understanding of human beings and planet Earth? Again, it comes from this interwoven, you know, multiplicity of the stories that come to us. But 
as you mentioned, the earth, to watch the earth, to watch, to watch, some, watch, a, watch a fruit rot and flatten and its flesh fall away, to watch the seed depress in the earth, to watch that seed grow, for it to bear something that looks, um, you know, like that's an impossibility. Like, you know, how we are with, with you know, like human beings, we age and we die and there's, there's, there's no record of anything else. You know, we, we all grow older and we die and we fight that as a phenomenon. Everybody wants to live forever. Everybody wants to be in good health. Everybody wants to be young forever. But the plants show you that regeneration is a natural part of the way that the earth holds itself. And uh, it, you have to be connected to more than just your own flesh. If you are only connected to the apple of your own flesh, then when that apple falls away, there's nothing else. But if you remain connected to the seed, if you understand that a new apple will come up and that a piece of you will go on, then you, 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 you are, you're connected and therefore you, you, you want everything to thrive. That's beautiful. That's so beautiful. Thank you so much, Stacey and Chin. If you have anything else to share, I'm sure our listeners want to hear more and more of you. But uh, in the last 30 seconds, if there's something that you want to <laughs> share before we can continue our conversation off the mic. Find us on um, Kindred on the Rock. It's K-I-N-D-R-E-D. Um, on the rock at kindred on the rock on I, on instagram you can find me stacy engine just google and find me on any social media platform i'm willing to converse, uh, continue this conversation in any format that people uh, may be interested in thank you so much for having me and um you know i love you so much and i love the work you do and so thank you very much for existing thank you likewise <laughs> big hugs and uh, stacy and chin kindred on the rock <laughs> I'm Ruchira Gupta and thank you for listening to A Free Voice. Subscribe to our podcast to get notifications of new episodes or check us out at ruchiragupta.com. The podcast is produced by Ram Devineni with Ratapalix and Bauri Poetry. Special thanks to Leela Kapoor and Anika Kothari. This podcast series is funded by the Citizen Diplomacy Action Fund which is sponsored by the U.S. Department of State and implemented by Global Ties U.S. in partnership with the Office of Alumni Affairs in the Bureau of Educational and Cultural Affairs. Additional support from New York State Council on the Arts, Governor of New York State and the New York State Legislature.